But if you invest your time and energy into attending the right events, you will find yourself in a room filled with like-minded people. And when events are done right, and there's some kind of either curation process or vetting process in place, finding yourself in a group of like-minded individuals is absolutely priceless. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Community Made Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Gaynard. As you know, the season is all about how to grow, nurture, and amplify your business relationships. In the very first few episodes of the season, I shared why relationships are the ultimate asset and how a live event in 2011 fundamentally changed the trajectory of my life. In episode two, I shared why proximity is power and how who you surround yourself with is who you become. And in today's episode, I'm going to cover one of the highest leverage ways that I know to build a base of relationships quickly, and that's through events and live experiences from networking dinners and mixers to workshops and talks to conferences and retreats. Investing the time, money, and energy into attending events is known by many as one of the best ways to build new relationships. However, for many of us, going to events can be painful, right? It's easy to become anxious or nervous when leaning into these type of experiences. So I plan to share with you a playbook that anyone can use to maximize the ROI of attending events with particular tips and tricks for all you introverts out there. Now, just as a quick side note, to help you get the most out of the next event that you attend, we designed a pre-event checklist. If you're a member of the Community Made group, you'll find that checklist in the resource section. If you're not a member, joining the Community Made group is free. Simply visit communitymade.com to get access. A second quick side note for fun, I decided to take some of the concepts from this season on how to grow, nurture, and amplify your business relationships and go deeper in an intimate workshop setting because I love live experiences, as you probably guess. I mean, that's what I dedicate my life to is hosting a live experience. So to my surprise, and I swear to God, I did not expect this. I was originally shooting a little bit of a transparent moment right now. I told my team that if I sold eight spots for this workshop, that would be a win. And we ended up selling the eight spots within a few hours of me making a Facebook post about it. And then we decided to move the group to 14 and it sold out and then to 20. And our first workshop, we ended up having 22 or 23 participants signed up in the first like day and a half of me announcing it. So because I was caught off guard by the demand, I guess you could say, we have people flying in from Australia, Spain, New York, all over the place for this workshop. So we decided to do a second one or we're going to host a second one. So for dates and availability on that, go to superconnectorworkshop.com. That's superconnectorworkshop.com. So where do we start this? In my opinion, great events and live experiences can be the ultimate unfair advantage when you're a high growth minded entrepreneur because they deliver on one of our most valuable assets as entrepreneurs speed the speed of growth the speed of wisdom and the speed of relationships let's first address i guess the notion of the speed of growth now i always say that if you're the smartest person in the room you're in the wrong room, right? If I could boil down my success to one thing is that I've always surrounded myself with people who are one or two steps ahead of me in all areas of life. Folks who make me feel uncomfortable on some level because that uncomfort forces me to grow unconsciously as quickly as possible to fill that gap between where I am and where they are. It's a, it's a way to leverage eustress, which is uh, the good stress that we talked about in a previous episode, along with our deep need to belong. Events can be a great vehicle to surround yourself with people who are playing at another level, whether that be in life or business. The second thing about events is the speed of wisdom. Now, I don't remember where I heard this from, but there's a saying that the good judgment comes from experience and experience often comes from bad judgment. Learning things for yourself can be costly. Learning things from the experience of others is a much better way to go. A Roman poet once said, nothing has yet been said that hasn't been said before. And I take it as nothing has been learned that hasn't been learned before. Success 
leaves clues. Being able to learn from speakers, panelists, and even your fellow peers at an event enables you to shave years off your learning curve. It gives you the ability to avoid costly mistakes and build off success. The third thing is speed of relationships. Listen, relationships, as you probably have got the idea by now, to me, relationships are the ultimate asset. I mean, events can be a great vehicle to connect people or connect you with people you wouldn't have really connected with otherwise. Let's say you and I are both entrepreneurs and we're walking downtown in a major city. Entrepreneurs make up 3% of the general population. So that means if we were to stop a thousand people at random on the street, only 30 out of that thousand will be business owners. To meet a business owner who's doing seven figures, well, that's even harder, right? They make up 4% of that 3% of people who are entrepreneurs. So that means that we would have to stop 25,000 people in order to meet 30 entrepreneurs with seven figure businesses. And to meet 30 entrepreneurs who are doing over $50 million a year, if you're in that bracket, you would have to stop a whopping 250,000 people at random. My point is, we are extremely rare. You would have to go to great lengths to meet other entrepreneurs, particularly those who have reached a certain level of success. But if you invest your time and energy into attending the right events, you will find yourself in a room filled with like-minded people. We've all gone to networking mixers where we really hit it off with one or two rock stars amongst a sea of other people there. And when events are done right, and there's some kind of either curation process or vetting process in place, finding yourself in a group of like-minded individuals is absolutely priceless. An important thing to note is that being, I guess in an environment like that, not only do you have the ability to foster a wide range of relationships with like-minded people in a condensed period of time, you reach a level of depth with these said relationships quickly because you're harnessing the power of uncommon commonalities. You need to go through different stages of intimacy when you first meet someone. There's small talk and then opinions, hopes and dreams, fears and weaknesses, needs. Well, when someone is similar to you, you move through those stages really quickly. Whether you have a business that's a certain size, maybe your business is in a specific industry, or even outside the notion of business, but maybe you're a parent, or you're a former athlete, or you formerly served in the military. The deeper the uncommon commonality, the deeper the bond. This is something you'll hear me talk a lot about in this episode, and probably in future episodes as well, because I think it's really important. In short, Great events, communities, and live experiences enable you to condense decades into days. It's decades of, of growth, decades of wisdom, and decades of relationships. It's really, honestly, if you follow Pareto's law, it's the 80-20 principle at its best, the 20% of your effort that gives you 80% of your results. Events often have the power to deliver a disproportionate amount of value for the investment made. Almost every time, looking back, someone has helped me overcome an obstacle, opened a door of opportunity, or made a profound introduction, it's happened because I originally connected with that person at a live event in the past. With that said, if you're not seeing an ROI from events, you're either attending the wrong events, or you're not leveraging them to their full potential. Now, one thing people always assume about me because I have this great peer group and have attended a lot of events in the past is that I'm a master at working the room and I hate to let the cat out of the bag. That is simply untrue. I was at an event in New Orleans a few years back, put on by a friend of mine named Yannick Silver. It was an event called The Underground. And I walked into, this is probably the first night of the event, I walked into this VIP reception with a friend of mine, and she was shocked to see that after a few minutes, I wasn't charming my way into conversations or showcasing a masterclass on small talk. Instead, I was pacing around the perimeter of the room, gauging, measuring, and watching people interact. It's not uncommon for me to be 
truth be told, like really uncomfortable in social settings when I'm new to a group. I mean, there's two instances recently where I walked into a reception for an event and that was in Denver. And then I walked into someone's house for a dinner party in Maui and I didn't know anyone. And in both scenarios, I walked around the room a few times to kind of get the lay of the land. I just straight up left. And I remember I went back to my hotel room in, in both cases to like psych myself up again before I went back out to give it another try. So all this to say, I'm no extrovert, right? If you had to, I guess, define me as a label, I probably fall under an ambivert because I can relate and show up with either introverted or extroverted tendencies, depending on the context. The environment also is a factor and ultimately really my level of comfort I have in that particular setting. And I think that's true for, for most people. I mean, we can be extroverted in a room with our closest friends, but put us somewhere where we don't know anyone and we may be wallflowers, right? We may be kind of hanging around the, the perimeter of the room near like the emergency exit. With that said, I try to steer clear of labeling people as introverts, ambiverts, or extroverts because labels in general can be really dangerous. As a father, I mean, I'm, I'm super cautious with that because if, if you use labels like you're smart, you're dumb, you're perfect, you know, people live up to labels or they can be constrained by them. And very rarely does someone fully subscribe to the full array of attributes that comes with a certain label. They often find themselves somewhere on a spectrum. And in most cases, people are a mix of different traits depending on the context. So I try to focus more on the level of comfort a person has in a particular setting instead of which label they identify with most. With that said, it's still very helpful to understand your own natural style or what you tend to, to gravitate towards most and work within your strengths, regardless what you subscribe to or where you land on that spectrum. In this episode, I'm going to share some field tested strategies that you can add to your building relationships at events playbook. So let's say you've registered for an event, you paid for your ticket, you booked your flight, well, the first step you need to take when it comes to networking at events is to consider the overall bandwidth you're about to invest to attend and how to really optimize the ROI you'll get from the experience. To frame how to make the most out of the experience at events, for me, I like to break it down into a, a rough ratio of 40, 20, 40. If I'm going to an event, I try to allocate 40% of my bandwidth to pre-event planning, 20% of my bandwidth towards participating at the event itself, and 40%, the remaining 40% for post-event follow-ups. The majority of folks do little to no pre-planning and little to no post-event follow-ups, which is a costly mistake in my opinion, because to me, that's really where the majority of the value stems from. So with the golden rule of 40, 20, 40 in mind, let's get right into it and talk pre-event. Now, this is the most crucial area of focus, in my opinion, especially if you have a difficult time navigating new social settings. Simply throwing virtually anyone into a new crowd can be problematic, but given the opportunity to plan and prepare beforehand, it can be a drastically different experience. Because of this, I put far more weight, again, on the notion of being comfortable versus labels like introversion or extroversion. If you're comfortable or uncomfortable in a social setting, we can be proactive and make you more comfortable through planning and preparation. So how does one prepare? Well, context matters, right? The type of event, the format, the people in attendance, what your desired outcomes are. There's a lot of things to take into account, but here are some general areas to explore. Now, no matter what event you find yourself in, you can bank on needing to do three things multiple times. Introducing yourself, sharing your story, and engaging in small talk. All three of these things are things that you can practice, refine, and get comfortable with in advance. Introducing yourself on the fly almost always goes wrong because you're nervous when you meet virtually anybody for the first time. This results in introductions being too long, too wordy, too timid, too boastful, all of which leave a bad first impression. There is a proven format to a great introduction, and my buddy Clay Bear and I talk about it in the next episode of this podcast. But when done right, your introduction will lead to people wanting to know more about you. 
and specifically your origin story. Again, this is something that you can easily prepare in advance. And I have three different lengths of stories I guess I use. I have like a 30 second version, a 90 second version, and a three minute or three to five minute version. Now context matters. And in some conversations, it will require you to share a short version of your story. And other conversations may require you to share a longer version. So have these prepared and memorized and constantly refine them. I've shared my story hundreds of times and always test, whether that be in conversation or from the stage, and I always test different variations to gauge reactions. Are they interested? Are they intrigued? Are they passive? Are they bored? Body language says a ton and I'm always refining my story based off of it. There's a saying, I think it's, it's in copywriting, that the purpose of every word is to lead to the next word, right? The same can be said with first-time interactions. Everything you share, including your story, should be intriguing, compelling, and leaving folks wanting to know more about you. As a quick side note, do not, I've, I've somewhat made this mistake in the past, more when I did speaking engagements, where I knew my story so well, it was so refined, that... It was just memorized and I would get emotionally detached, I guess, from my story and go on like autopilot when uh, in conversation. And again, you don't want to do that. You want to know your story really well, specifically the order of events and how you'll tell it, but don't know your story word for word. The third and final thing that you can prepare for is small talk. Nothing is more awkward than when you meet someone for the first time, you exchange a few words back and forth, and then there's this like dead space in the conversation where you're both standing there kind of staring at each other and neither of you know what to say next, right? I've been there a ton of times. So have three to five small talk questions in the back of your mind at all times to fill those conversation gaps. Some of the small talk things that I use, again, context matters, but you know, I'll ask what brings you to this event? Is this your first time here? How did you hear about this event? Do you know the event organizer? If so, how do you know the event organizer? Where are you from? Were you born in? And so if somebody says I was born in Toronto, then you say, you know, were you born and raised in Toronto? If the answer to that question is yes, then you could say, well, you know, has Toronto changed a lot over the years? And if the answer is no, which is actually usually the answer I'm hoping for, then I follow up with, well, how did you find yourself in Toronto, for example? And then that usually starts to lead into a good conversation. One question that I love to ask is, have you met anybody interesting here thus far? Or have you connected with anyone here that has really impressed you? This question is great for several reasons. First, it's a great small talk question. It can easily be asked early on when meeting someone. And when asked, it takes the focus off of them for a few seconds, which will in turn make them feel a little more comfortable. The second thing is, should you, I mean, you should always be considering who else to connect with and why. A question like this easily helps you identify who are the, some of the rock stars in the room. The third thing is, should I meet that said person later, I'd like to bring up that so-and-so made mention that that specific individual made a lasting impression on them. And when you do that, everyone wins. The person I'm talking to wins because they feel special and significant that someone else is talking about them. The person that talked about them in the first place wins because now they've built more rapport with them because of it. And I win because I'm coming from a place of, of higher rapport because of social proof, right? You were referred by someone they had already connected with earlier instead of meeting them cold. So it's a fantastic way to open conversation. With that said, it's important to think not only about the initial question, but the follow-up questions as well. From their answers, I mean, you should be able to dig deeper into conversation. In my, in my opinion, the purpose of small talk is to find an area of commonality or common ground, right? That could be a shared commonality from the past. Like maybe you share a mutual friend or a shared commonality from the present. Maybe you're both in a similar industry or a shared commonality in the future. Maybe you have similar end goals. The way I look at it, and I talk about this more towards the end of the season, but I look at it almost like a, a, a marketing funnel, right? If if you're talking about all kinds of stuff across various topics, I mean, you're, you're searching for what you share in common and you know, look outside of business as well. But once you you find those commonalities, you slowly move down that marketing funnel or really that funnel of intimacy. When I met uh, Joe Gebbia, who's one of the co-founders of Airbnb, I mean, we shared 
very little in common out of the gate. I mean, he's a billionaire. I'm not. Uh, he has a very big passion for design. I don't. A lot of his day is dedicated towards working with lobbyists and fighting government over legislation. I avoid red tape at all costs. On the surface level, we share entrepreneurship and we share business as a commonality, but millions of people share that commonality with him. So that's simply not strong enough. Again, the deeper the uncommon commonality, the deeper the bond. But after talking with him, just about a wide range of topics for over an hour, I discovered that uh, towards the end of our uh, conversation, one of his most recent passions was Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, something that I've been personally practicing for over seven years. So I naturally steered the conversation in that direction, leading us to geek out for over like 20 minutes. And to me, you know you've hit rapport building gold when you can both geek out about a specific topic or person. And when you find that commonality, double down on that one area of conversation and go as deep as you can. Now, let's talk a little bit about the second area of preparation, which is research. Research those who will be speaking and research those who will be in attendance. Even though MMT were one of the few events that does not provide an attendee list in advance, and we have our reasons for it, which I won't get into here, but the majority of events do provide some kind of Rolodex or maybe an app. So you can usually get a snapshot of, of some of the people that will be going to the event. So dig deep into bios, blogs, PR, their social media profiles, capture interesting things about them, potential uncommon commonalities that you may oddly enough share along with any mutual friends that you may have as well. I mean, I, at the time when I was kind of sitting with this, I was actually at an event in Mexico and, uh, they had a, a Rolodex of those that were going to be in attendance, and I printed the entire thing out. It was only about 50 attendees, but not only did I study the profiles, next to each name, I wrote two or three areas of interest that we could connect over and prepared one or two questions that I had in my back pocket to get conversation going. Should we sit across from each other at dinner or be waiting you know, for a session together in the lobby or those kind of things? Researching in advance will not only give you an unfair advantage when walking into a room, it will result in you being way more comfortable overall because you're not walking into that room blind. So with research done, it's now time to strategize. First, you want to set yourself up for success. Let's say one of the first place I guess we could start is what you're going to wear. Now it sounds trivial, but when you look good, you feel good. And when you feel good, you do good. So you want to go into social settings as confident as possible. And clothes definitely have the ability to boost your mood and confidence. Now, there's a lot of resources out there on how to dress for success. I'll put that in air quotes. But with that said, I mean, I've been in this game 14, 15 years now. And my belief, and I've gone to a lot of networking mixers and all the events galore, my belief is that there's no better approach than simply being unapologetically you. I've gone to business events with a hoodie where everybody else is rocking suits. And I have a friend of mine, Brian, wears these bright red pants when he goes to a conference. I have another friend of mine named Satya who wore cat ears when she went to a Forbes 30 under 30 gathering. These type of clothing and accessories, I mean, they work because they're authentic expressions of who those individuals are. Brian is a very fun and colorful guy, so his red pants are fitting. Satya is... <laughs> I can't help but smile. This girl is a ball of energy and she's super playful. So cat ears, although definitely outside my comfort zone, are really, they're totally her. So clothes, they not only have a huge impact on first impressions, but can serve also as a great filter when it comes to new relationships. Because Brian is fun and colorful, it's likely that on the surface, he wouldn't connect well with somebody, you know, in a three-piece suit. The caveat to this is that the person wearing the suit could indeed be drawn to Brian if their authentic style is similar. I've, again, gone to conferences or meetings or whatever in a hoodie, and somebody will come up to me and we'll be talking, and then they'll they'll make mention of the, shoot, I wish I would have dressed like you. So ultimately, you know, in Brian's case with his bright red pants, which again, his vibe, which is being articulated through his choice of clothes, really, it attracts his tribe. One of the other important things to note is that in a sea of business casual, red pants and cat ears 
are memorable. These are signals in a sea of noise. I mean, looking back over the years, I can still remember a handful of people from specific events based purely on what they wore. And I often get asked, you know, what's your stance on like business cards at events? The truth is I haven't had a business card for over eight years. I think, you know, three businesses ago is when I had a business card last. And the same could be said with many of my friends. My belief is that if you're not worth remembering without a business card, it's probably not a relationship worth investing in. If they remember you, they will find you afterwards on Facebook or LinkedIn. Now, context, again, obviously matters. And sometimes you need to play a little bit of a chameleon depending on the environment and your desires. But I mean, I've still gone to tuxedo galas and was able to sprinkle a little authentic Jason by wearing a rubber ducky bow tie. So I err on the side of, you know, being unapologetically you. But again, there's a lot of great resources out there on how to quote unquote dress for success. New environments with that said can be I mean, they're, they're overwhelming to, to navigate both consciously and unconsciously. So I, I try to plan out my experience as much as possible. Where am I going to eat? What am I going to order? I mean, this stuff may sound trivial, but decision fatigue can take a toll on you and you'll want to conserve as much energy as possible for the event itself. One thing I ask myself as well is, is there a gym nearby? I mean, there's a ton of studies that show the positive effects of physical activity on your mental state. In an ideal world, I want to try to start every day with some form of physical activity, whether that be weights, sitting in a sauna, or yoga. Physical strain on the body releases an opioid in the brain called dynorphin, which gives you a, a feeling of dysphoria or unease or discomfort. And to compensate for that, the human body is amazing, the brain then increases the production and sensitivity of receptors for euphoric hormones like beta endorphins. So you may have heard or, or recognized this reaction called like the runner's high, and that's a euphoric, calm, and clear state reached after a long period of aerobic exercise. All this to say, taking advantage of some kind of physical activity can have a profound impact on how you show up at an event. If you walk into a room euphoric, calm, and clear, you're stacking the cards in your favor. So how you look and how you feel when going to an event is fully within your control. So let's talk strategy. Armed with the research you've already done, you can now prioritize who you want to connect with. There's a caveat to this, but ultimately you have very limited bandwidth when at an event, right? There are far more people to connect with than you have time. So prioritizing when possible is an important exercise to do. Now, for most, prioritization would be creating a hit list of people to connect with based on you know, who can support them with their goals or maybe connecting with somebody because they're notable or have high social status. This will often result in overlooking certain people at an event. And most of us have been at events before where you're in conversation with somebody and they're overlooking your shoulder because they see a speaker that walked behind you or those kind of things. Don't be that guy or girl. I mean, don't strive to simply work up the social ladder. Connect with people because you find them fascinating, not because you think they're famous on some level. For me, prioritizing is simply designed to foster the easiest relationships first. So I prioritize based on people I know I will most likely hit it off with, folks who share similar uncommon commonalities to me, as I mentioned before. If I discover through research that someone there is writing a book, well, that's an uncommon commonality that we can connect over. If I discover through research that someone at this event has a podcast, well, that's an uncommon commonality that we can connect over. Or maybe I discover through research that you know, we share mutual friends, right? That's definitely an uncommon commonality that we can connect over. Early on at an event, I'm looking to build my tribe, I guess you could say. I'm striving to connect with people of similar values, experiences, industries, and goals, because that's really the low-hanging fruit of relationship building. And again, it's it's really, it's the easiest relationships to, to form out of the gate. And for me, because I, I suffer sometimes from low confidence early on in new social settings, once I have a few relationships as a base, I'll be much more confident to strike up conversations with almost anyone. On this note of building a tribe, I try to host dinners and lunches 
whenever possible. I mean, the majority of events don't have these planned. And because where am I going to eat is an afterthought for many, it can be easy to become the catalyst connecting a group of people simply by making a few reservations and inviting people in advance or in conversation while at the event. I'll share more about how to facilitate these types of dinners in the Becoming a Catalyst episode later this season, which is definitely worth checking out. But again, it's something that I employ quite a bit when going to events. The last thing that research enables you to do is effectively steer conversation when you meet somebody new. As mentioned earlier, you often need to touch on a wide range of topics initially in order to find an uncommon commonality that you may share. But if you've done your research in advance, similar to what I talked about when I printed out that sheet of the 50 people, I I listed out those uncommon commonalities that we share so that I could steer the conversation in that way. And with that said, I mean, you have to be cautious, you know, armed with this information. You don't want to say like, hey, Jason, our wives have the same name. Like that would just be creepy. But there's stages of intimacy. Like, you again, you don't want to go from stage one, small talk, to stage 10, all in one sentence. But with proper research, you have the unfair advantage of knowing some of the uncommon commonalities in advance that you may be sharing with certain individuals. And you could simply keep that intel in your back pocket when it comes to steering the conversation. The last thing to note about strategy is go in with low expectations. Don't aim to connect with every single person at the event. Depending on the the length of the event, shoot to have, you know, great conversations with three to eight people. I see people make the mistake all the time trying to connect with everyone, which ultimately leaves, leaves them building deep relationships with nobody, right? Don't make that mistake. So it's game time, right? You, you've planned, you've prepared, you strategize. Now we're in execution. You've graduated. Let's say I'm about to walk into a conference room for the first time. Well, earlier that morning, I went to the gym. I had a light breakfast. The night before, I was able to host a small dinner with some of the other attendees who I invited based on my research prior to the event. So I already have a small tribe of new relationships as a base. This is kind of ideal. So if you have that, you're walking into the room, most likely at that point, feeling pretty good. If I see one of those people from the night prior, I may walk in with them into the conference room and and doing so is really, really, I guess, a power move on some level because walking in and wandering around a room full of people alone is is difficult. My goal once in the room is simply to get comfortable. I mean, a, a quick side note is that I'm not myself, I guess you could say, when I first walk into a room. I've learned firsthand through many Tony Robbins events and a lot of personal development that your physiology controls your psychology. And if you walk into a room with your shoulders slouched or you're looking down or you're speaking in a, in a soft voice, you're not going to hit it out of the park when it comes to first impressions. But if you come in with a strong posture and a big smile, you will command a, a strong presence. Now, you may not be someone who naturally has a strong posture and a big smile, but that doesn't mean you can't act your way into a new way of thinking and leverage those positive attributes. This is the rare time, and I'm hesitant to say this, but I don't know how else to frame it. This is a rare time that I'll advocate to fake it until you make it. And the reason for that is because it turns out that developing a kind of an alter ego of sorts is a very common practice amongst peak performers. My good friend Todd Herman, who happens to be a global leader in peak performance and actually feature him on the mentorship episode a little later on in the podcast, he's actually in the process of writing a book about this called The Alter Ego Effect. And here's what he had to say about the power of alter egos. When I played football and badminton, I was a National League badminton player too, but I leveraged and used alter egos. Like I was this scrawny little kid from Medicine Hat, Alberta that weighed no more than 162 pounds, but I played like I was 215 pounds, like just practicing the skills and knowing how to hit someone, but then I just thought of myself as someone bigger out there. And I loved that, you know, when you see a kind of a scrawny kid with kind of pads kind of flopping all over the place because they're really too big for him anyway, coming at you, you're not really going to break down and or be concerned about this guy <laughs> smashing you, but I would. And so, but I, I played channeling these different characters and alter egos. And then when I started working with athletes on the mental game, this common thread started kind of connecting all of these athletes that were performing at a consistently high level. Whereas the ones who were consistently underperforming all had a common thread and the common thread that they were joined together with was they lacked this one thing. The people who were performing at a high level were using 
an alter ego. They didn't say alter ego. They would just say, you know, like, I just step into a different version of myself. Like, those, that'd be the kind of the common language. And I would just be like, here's something like, oh, really? What did you do? Because I did the same thing. I thought it was just weird. that, And that's what we were connecting on it. And then just going through my notes of all of my clients, I was like, wait a second. There's this pattern that's here that everyone seems to be using a character. We all take insecurities or self-doubts or judgments with us out onto the field of play, whatever that is, whether it's a business person, an entrepreneur, an athlete, a tennis player, whatever. And and that's not where it should be. We, we shouldn't be carrying our self-doubts out there. So we need to create and step into a different version of ourselves. For Todd, and as it turns out, most of the world's top performers, alter egos are an important part of achieving peak performance because, again, without them, we run the risk of carrying our insecurities and self-doubts with us onto the field, and in this case, into the conference room. Another great example of alter egos in practice would be football player Bo Jackson. I remember Todd telling me that Bo Jackson said that he never played down a football in his life. Bo's everyday personality is, is a very kind of nice and mellow guy, but he was known to be just a monster on the field. And for him, the trigger was when his heel would hit the field, like when his, I think it was his right heel, when it hit the field, that's when he would switch into his, his alter ego. So same person, two different identities. And I can tell you from personal experience, I choose to kind of lean into my own kind of alter ego and walk into an event for the first time, that fun, outgoing, and owning a room identity does a much better job building relationships and setting a lasting impression than my shy, timid, and low confidence identity, which I can, you know, play in most of the time. If you're walking into a room alone, you know, try gathering your bearings. You're probably not the only one. So find someone else walking the perimeter of the room as well and try to strike up a conversation. You'll probably be their savior. And on some level, they'll be your savior as well. And if you're you're not alone, it's, it's easy to stick with your partner or a small group for a bit. However, I always share this Brene Brown saying to choose courage over comfort. Either steer your group in ways to integrate new people or break off every once in a while with a peace of mind of knowing that you have a tribe that you can go back to at any time. Eventually, you'll find yourself in a new conversation with a new person and you'll have your intro, your story, your small talk. Let's say things aren't going well. Uh, how do you cut the conversation short effectively without hurting feelings? This is a, a big question that I get. Well, for me, my go-to move is I'll ask, are you sticking around for the next little bit? And I'll contextualize this question. For example, if this is a three-day event and we're meeting on day one, I'll say, are you sticking around for the next three days? The answer inevitably is some version of yes. So then I'll add, well, awesome, let's reconnect in a little bit, or I'm gonna head to the washroom real quick, or give me your card, I'd love to stay connected. It's simple, it's quick, it's clean, and most importantly, it does not burn any bridges. We do have a strong innate ability to judge people accurately based on first impressions, but I've been wrong before. First impressions in a setting like an event can be misleading because people, again, are nervous, they're anxious, so I never want to burn any bridges. I never want somebody to feel like they've been dismissed. With that said, there's a very little time to invest into meeting new people and events, so unless you really hit it off with somebody, I try to graciously cut the conversation short and postpone it for another time. I can't stress enough that you must avoid hurting the feelings or burning bridges at all costs. You never fully know, especially again, based off first impressions, who people are, who they know, or most importantly, who they will become. Right? You can't connect the dots looking forward, so treat everyone like they are important because on some level they are. But remember that it's also a fine dance because you want to be cautious with how you invest your time. Now let's say you have your intro, you have your story, your small talk, things are going well. This is somebody you want to continue to talk to. This is somebody you want to continue to learn about. At this point, I start to shift the spotlight to them and focus on getting them to do the majority of the talking. And the reason I do this is threefold. One, it's, uh, it's easier <laughs> to be the one asking the question sometime than, than answering it. The second reason is people love to talk about themselves. Researchers at Harvard University of Social Cognitive and Effective Neuroscience Lab found that 
talking about ourselves actually triggers the chemical reactions in the brain as sex, which motivates us to want to share more about ourselves to activate those pleasure centers even more. The same researchers also found that listening more than you talk and asking two or more follow-up questions makes you more likable in the eyes of your conversation partners. The third reason is intel. Similar to your preparation phase when you're capturing interesting notes and facts about people, except you're doing it in a live setting. I'm trying to extract things, including what they care about, who they care about, what they're good at, what their goals are, what are obstacles keeping them from those said goals are. I mean, those are really kind of the five core things that I'm trying to extract. And because these are really important, let me probably break them down individually and let you know why I'm trying to get those, those pieces of intel. Now, first is, as I made mention in the gift giving episode, if you want to care about someone, care about who or what they care about. Capturing anything and everything that is dear to them, areas of passion, a charity that they support, the name of their child. This is the gold found below the surface level conversation stuff, right? And the reason that this is gold is because future recall, which drives rapport. Let me give you an example of what I mean. I met a guy named Mike back at an event in 2011. And let's say I were to meet him now, it's been seven years. Well, most people start a conversation by saying, hey man, how's life, how's business? That's fine, but that's very surface level. Instead, the direction I would go is, hey man, how are things? Oh dude, by the way, like how's your daughter doing? It's been a while since we last spoke, but I remember you know, things were starting to look pretty positive for her. And the reason I bring that up is because when I met Mike, again, 2011, I learned about his business. I learned about the people he served. So very kind of surface level stuff. But I also discovered that his daughter was born blind. And at the time that he shared this with me, she was six months old and it looked like she was going to start to see and her progress was really promising. So I could have asked, you know, how are things with your business? But I went right to the core of what he cares about deeply. And the end result is a very different conversation. It's a very different tone. Now you hear me talk about this a lot. We all have a deep primal desire to be seen, to be valued, to be heard, to be understood, to be appreciated. These all fall under the umbrella of being seen. And if you could make someone feel seen by you, you own a piece of real estate in that person's head and in their heart that very few people close to them occupy. The next thing I'm trying to extract is what they are good at. And the reason for this is simple. I'm always looking to build an army of problem solvers. So, you know, I'd say, oh, you have this problem. Let me introduce you to this person or that person. Call it being a super connector or a master networker. At the highest level, I'm always trying to solve problems for people through other people. With that said, the desire to understand their goals is for the same reason. Not only do I want them in my Rolodex as problem solvers, but I want to solve any obstacles in their way as well. Now, some folks, you know, they ask outright, what are some of your goals for the coming year? Or what are some of the areas you're struggling with right now? But boring questions yield boring answers. My two absolute go-to questions to identify someone's goals and potential obstacles are, if we were to meet a year from today with a bottle of champagne, what are we celebrating? I got this from my good friend Clay Bear, who we feature in the next episode. It is a brilliant question, but I also follow it up with, you know, let's say their answer is, I want to get my book on the New York Times bestseller list. I follow up with, that's awesome. In order to get your book on the New York Times bestseller list, is there something you need to solve or overcome? These questions produce gold consistently. The quality of your questions determine the quality of your conversation. So always be on the lookout for great questions that you can keep in your back pocket to enable you to dig deeper into conversation. Relationships move at the speed of vulnerability. So the faster you can take the conversation below the surface level, the better, right? Dig deep into what they care about, who they care about, what they're good at, what their goals are, the obstacles that are keeping them from achieving those set goals. The capturing of this intel can be done in different ways. I'll say it outright, you know, big mistake 
that that people make is they they pull out their phones in a live setting. And that is a huge mistake. Why? Because science has shown that even when a phone is simply placed on a table face down, it impacts the level of intimacy and depth of a relationship. Researchers from Virginia Tech examined the relationship between the presence of a mobile device and the quality of in-person social interactions. And they found that people who engaged in 10 minute conversations where there were no phones around whatsoever reported much higher levels of empathy and concern than those who engaged in conversations with their phones on the table between them or even just holding them in their hands. And this was true regardless of variables in age, gender, ethnicity, and mood. So just having a phone around can weaken the intimacy or connectedness two people will feel during a conversation. It's even worse if you pick up the phone and you start typing. Now, even though, you know, we hope that the person typing on the other end is typing down notes and capturing notes, unconsciously, we associate someone having a phone in their hand with a lack of presence. So instead of having a phone... I bring a notepad with me, and for some reason, a notepad has a complete opposite effect of a cell phone. When somebody whips out a notepad and writes something down, it often makes us feel like something we said was important or it was meaningful. Another cool alternative is to have a quote unquote small bladder. Now I forgot where I heard of this, I guess, strategy, but I think it's it's smart. Having a small bladder means that you frequently kind of step away between conversations to write down notes. Now, another quick trick that I use, which is is faster in my opinion, is I'll step outside after a conversation and I'll grab my phone and I'll regurgitate everything I remember from that conversation into an audio recording. And then I take that audio recording and it goes to my assistant and she basically writes down notes specific to that person and puts it into our CRM. So that's how you walk into a room as your best self and set the foundation for lasting relationships with some of your fellow attendees. With that said, What about the speakers? Most will have a dream list of speakers that they they would like to meet, thank, or pitch. Regardless of your desired outcome, I have some advice. First is there's two types of events. I mean, there's smaller, more intimate events like mastermind talks where you have great access to speakers since they're usually a, a part of the audience. And then you have larger events where you have very little access to speakers and both carry different approaches. Let me first start by saying that The one thing you should strive for, regardless if it's a small, intimate event or a large event, is to connect with a speaker anytime other than when they set foot off stage. This is when their stock is at its highest. It never fails. I mean, this is when they get just rushed by people and it's absolutely the worst opportunity for you to leave any kind of impression at all. So let's look at a strategy for an intimate event. Now you saw the speaker list in advance and there's someone that you wanna connect with. Well, now what? Well, first, if possible, try establishing a micro connection in advance, something that puts you on their radar but that doesn't require that they make any real investment to respond. It could be a simple tweet that you're excited to hear them speak or even a quick email if you have access to their email address. And if an email is is how you choose to go, ensure that it's short, it's sweet, it's not about you, and that you put in bold at the bottom of the email, no response required. Busy people will appreciate you alleviating the expectation of them to respond. And most still choose to to respond, but it signals that you know there's a huge demand of their time and it helps them deal with the guilt associated with not responding because of time constraints. Another strategy I like to apply, depending on the hotel, is sending an amenity to the room, saying something along the lines of, best of luck with your talk, or I'm really excited to hear you speak. But there's a couple things to to keep in mind with the strategy. First is it's easy to find out what hotel a speaker would be staying at as it's generally the host hotel for the event or the hotel where they've secured discounted rooms for attendees. The second thing is you can simply send a note without an amenity. However, sending a note with some sort of thoughtful gift is always a great way to stand out. The third thing is I said depending on the hotel earlier because crappy hotels unfortunately offer crappy amenities oftentimes. So you don't wanna send them a bruised fruit basket as it's a bad first impression. If you're at the Four Seasons, you know they'll, they'll have a catalog of just killer amenities to choose from. But if your host hotel is the Holiday Inn, you may have to source a gift or amenity from, from elsewhere. I mean, you can plan in advance and, and build your own amenity. I know somebody who I shared this philosophy with and she goes to conferences and she brings like something that's local to her and she'll give that as a gift. And that's another approach to it. The fourth important thing as well 
in relation to, to this idea is don't set any expectations and don't make an ask in the note. Meaning, don't say, here's my email. I would love to talk about this business opportunity with you. And don't use it as a vehicle to, to go up to them later. And I've had this happen where people go up to you at the event afterwards and say, hey, did you get my note or did you get my gift? It puts them on the spot and, and it, it, it's uncomfortable. It seems contrived. And you know, let them connect the dots should you actually meet. Give like you won't get acknowledged for it. I mean, I think that's probably the best way to approach it. Give without expectations. Now, once you've sent out that, that micro connection, similar to what I shared before, learn interesting things about them, potential uncommon commonalities that you may share, and see if you have any mutual friends. Now, when you see them at the event, try to strike up conversation before they get on stage. I can't stress this enough. Again, the minute they walk off the stage, their stock rises significantly. So try to connect with them before. I mean, I've seen speakers sitting alone, and this happens a lot, sitting alone at breakfast countless times where nobody pays them any mind. So strike up conversation. If it comes from a genuine place, you know, share with them that you're a fan of their work and you know, specifically point out to some of it. The more obscure, the better. Don't just say, I loved your book. Say, what specific part of the book that you enjoyed? How did you apply it? You know, what results did you get? If you come up to me, you listen to the podcast or you've read my book, you've applied something and you got a result, you pretty much have my full attention. And I know that can be said with many other author friends of mine. If you're at a larger event, you may not have the opportunity to connect before they go on stage, although you could still make that micro connection in advance. In this case, during their talk, sit in the front row and lean in and give them the gift of presence. When most people in the audience, unfortunately, this is just the way things are in today's day and age, most people in the audience are distracted on their phones. If somebody is there in the front row and they lean in and they give you 100% of their attention, you get noticed. And trust me, it's appreciated. Another great opportunity to stand out is during Q&A, if there's an opportunity to, to take advantage of that. First, ask the question, the first question when possible, because there's always this little apprehension by everyone when a Q&A starts because nobody wants to be first. So if you stand up right away, you stand out. And the second thing is ask a great question that's well thought out. 95% of the questions asked in the Q&A settings, they're either self-serving or they simply haven't been well thought out at all. So if you ask a well thought out question that potentially makes the speaker look good while answering it, you're golden. At the end of the talk, if you really need to connect with a speaker, expect to fight, again, a handful of people for their attention. And two huge mistakes people make when approaching a speaker fresh off the stage is they ask for a selfie. And uh, this is a mistake that I talk about extensively in a future episode called Reaching the Unreachable. Or they make an ask or a pitch right on the spot. And it's safe to say that asking for anything when they just got off the stage is probably the absolute worst time because they are in a heightened state because they are in a swarm of people. And the perfect pitch at a bad time is a bad pitch. So instead, should you have an ask or a pitch, two ninja ways to approach this is to either ask who on your team could I email, which steers clear of the awkward pressure committing to something on the spot, or come armed and come armed with a note. I package what I want to say, whether it be an ask or a simple thank you in a note and just hand it to them and say, I value your time immensely. You're obviously in high demand right now. I just wanted to give you this to read at your convenience. I mean, it's, it's easier to get a first chance than a second one. So those are some of my go-to approaches if you need to connect with a speaker right off the stage when they are in the presence of a sea of people. Two other ways to get a note to a speaker. One is through their inner circle. Uh, it's not uncommon to see a speaker travel around with their assistant, their publicist, or even their spouse. The second option is to simply have the note left in their room. Again, most speakers stay at the same hotel as the attendees, so this is an easy one. A quick side note is to make sure that the tone of whatever's included in the note has no expectations around it. If this is a thank you note, include your name and maybe your email address. Don't say, I look forward to hearing from you. If it's a business opportunity present it as such and don't set an expectation to reply unless it's of interest to them this often leaves the re recipient feeling a tinge of resentment as they have a big demand on their time and if you're saying like hey 
can't wait to hear from you or you're basically listening that you want some kind of response, it'll most likely lead them to not responding at all. You want them to feel compelled to reply or to follow up. So a thoughtful note will most often receive a reply with no call to action required. Oddly enough, I gave a note to a speaker through this whole sending it to the room, I guess, strategy back in 2015. And he actually emailed me <laughs> like literally two weeks ago. So three years later, for some reason, he put it in his briefcase and didn't read it and just stumbled across it and reached out to me. And him and I have been going kind of back and forth ever since. So it's a strategy that works. One last thing to add is that if you're a ninja, one of the best ways to connect with speakers is by connecting them. So become that catalyst by hosting a mastermind dinner. I've done this at a ton of events with great success. Again, a lot of events don't produce any kind of speaker dinner or any of that kind of stuff. And oftentimes, for some reason, they do it at the end, which I'm not necessarily sure why, if they do it at all. So that's something I'll chat more about in the Becoming a Catalyst episode this season. But ultimately, researching, writing a note, or coming up with a thoughtful question for a q and is, I mean, it's a lot of work. But as I always say, when you go the extra mile, it's never crowded. So now that the event is over, it's time to really get the most out of it. It's easy to get lazy at this stage and, and get sidetracked by a backlog of work, but don't. This is honestly where the magic happens. My follow-up process is capture, capitalize, close, and check in. So first, let's, let's dig into capture. So capturing is taking the intel that I wrote down throughout the event and putting it somewhere. Again, intel like, you know, what people care about, who they care about, what they're good at, what their goals are, what are obstacles keeping them from those set goals. I then plug that into a CRM. What CRM? Doesn't matter. It could even be a Google Doc. I actually use Google Spreadsheets for the longest time. Just ensure you take that intel and you capture it somewhere. The second thing is capitalizing. So I sit down with a list of people from the event and note which ones I want to invest time in and, and bandwidth to really kind of foster a deeper relationship. And I follow up. I'll generally shoot an email or Facebook message making mention that it was great to meet them and then try to point to something unique about our interaction, whether that be something they said, an experience that we shared, something I may have promised like a connection or a resource. Again, we all have a deep desire to be seen and that's a great opportunity to cap off your first impression on a high note. Now, an important thing to make mention here is that this is also a great opportunity to reach out to people you may have not have had time to connect with at the event. I've reached out to people countless times via email or social media afterwards saying, hey there, you know, we brushed by each other a few times at the event last week, but didn't have an opportunity to connect. Just want to say I'm a huge fan of your, your work. And again, be very specific, or it could be, you know, your work, your business, you know, insert whatever you have here as really as long as it's sincere. So hopefully we'll have an opportunity to cross paths in the near future. You can ask to do a call or a coffee date in that outreach. However, generally my goal is to simply plant a seed to the relationship. Now, full transparency, you know, this is a really great tactic if you had the opportunity to strike up a conversation at the event, but ultimately chickened out. I've done this before. And uh, so I've used this kind of strategy in the past. That I was like, oh, you know, it was great to like brush by you. Unfortunately, we didn't have a chance to connect and kind of lean in with that if you feel awkward in some of those kind of first time settings. Now, if you did indeed have, you know, great conversation with somebody, the follow up could be more personalized. An example could be, you know, hey, Mark, it, it was awesome to connect with you over dinner last night. I appreciate you sharing the details of how you and your wife, you know, work together so effectively in the business 2018 or 2019, you know, sounds like it's going to be a big year for you. Uh, I'm excited to hear what you're working that you're working on this new book. I know one of your desires is to hit the New York Times list. As mentioned, I have a few friends who orchestrated the launch of best-selling books in the last year. If an opportunity to speak with one of them would be of interest, simply let me know. Also, as promised, here are some resources I made mention of when we were chatting. Should you find yourself in Toronto anytime in the coming months, let me know. Hopefully, we'll cross paths again soon. Enjoy the rest of your week. Now, context 
obviously matters. Personalization obviously matters. But here's a few things I'm trying to hit on in that follow-up emails. First, acknowledgement of something they shared in conversation. As mentioned before, we all have a deep desire to be heard and seen. So I tried to lead with important note that I took from our interaction. The second thing, if I captured it, I make mention of their goal, which I can extract from that champagne moment question. And if possible, try to support them with it. Reconfirming you know their goals and that you're cheering them on builds a deeper level of intimacy. The third thing is I follow up with any resources that I may have promised. So many times in conversations we share that we'll follow up with a website or the name of a book or connection and rarely do. And I'm even in certain settings where I'll be at a dinner, other people promise or they'll make mention of an article or make mention of a book, I'll actually write that stuff down and I'll follow up in conversation and be like, hey, you know, here's some of the books that were mentioned over dinner or those kind of things. So yeah, that's a that's a, another great approach. I've I've been guilty of not following up and it's it's something I definitely try to do as much as possible with resources and that kind of stuff. The fourth thing is depending on the context, you can lead with a call to action. Like, you know, I'd love to chat more. Let's do a call. But 98% of the time, my follow-ups end on hopefully we'll cross paths again soon. Enjoy the rest of your week. Because again, my goal is to plant a seed. Now, what do I mean by planting a seed? As this is the second time or third time, probably I reference that. At this stage, I simply don't have bandwidth for more relationships. I'll talk more about that in the relationship kind of where I talk about relationship management and prioritization in a future episode called how to build a world-class network. But in a nutshell, my focus is to go wide with my networking and deep with my nurturing. My belief is that access is the ultimate asset and that you cannot connect the dots looking forward. You never know when you're going to need someone's expertise, their endorsement, maybe an introduction, and you never want to reach out to them cold for it. So my focus is to build thousands of weak ties by planting thousands of relationship seeds, such as a simple email follow-up. And the reason for the simple email follow-up and why it's so effective is should I need to reach out to that person two years from now, whatever request I need to make, I do it using that original email chain. I don't write a fresh new email. The reason for this is to kind of leverage consistency bias. You know, they may have forgotten about me, and rightfully so, if it's been a couple years and we only met at an event, but we all have a deep desire to remain consistent. So if you send a request while subtly refreshing their memory about a past interaction that you had with them that ended on a high note, you're much more likely to get a yes than if you were to reach out to them cold. Three important things to note when it comes to capitalizing on follow-ups. First, don't follow up right after the event. Generally wait a week or two. Most people are trying to deal with the backlog of being away for a few days, so it's easy for your follow-up to get lost in the noise if you send it right after the event. The second thing is, and you hear, you'll hear me talk about this a lot, what works in the military works in relationship building, and that's the unexpected. A follow-up is almost unexpected enough as most people don't take the time to do it, but what's, I guess the more thought and effort you invest, the more impact it will yield, right? I mean, for me, what's better than an email is like a video email. I've done a lot of these as follow-ups and people still bring up their effectiveness in conversation years later. Maybe video isn't your thing. Maybe, you know, it's a handwritten note. That's another example of going above and beyond and cutting through the noise. If it's a speaker you're looking to build a deeper relationship with, you can send a thank you note or a thank you on Twitter, or you can write them an email or better yet, write a blog post about some of your takeaways from their talk. Again, the more thought and effort, the more impact. Now, after capturing and capitalizing, it's time to close the loop. This is a ninja tactic that I started probably leveraging a year or two ago, and it works so well to either plant new relationship seeds through credibility via association or to reinforce existing relationships. Let me give you two quick examples. The first one was I was at an event uh, last year in Denver with the CEO of Evernote. And over breakfast, we were talking about hiring best practices. And he may mention that when he moved from Google to take over the role as CEO at Evernote, he hired a coach who wrote a pretty widely read and respected business book. And he was singing her praises as to how impactful she was to his transition. I then reached out to her via email post event a couple weeks later, and I simply relayed some of the sentiments that he had shared over breakfast of how impactful she was really to his career. And it's it's important to note that you don't want to inflate 
what was said, because you need to be aware that there's a chance that he or she may CC or BCC that other person on that email. And the last thing you want to do is overstep any boundaries. I simply, I close the loop by kind of clearly, concisely making mention again that, you know, somebody was, was speaking very highly of them. And I, again, I set no expectations of a reply. When done right, everybody wins. I mean, similar to what I talked about before, the person I'm emailing wins because they feel special and significant that someone else is talking about them. The person that I talked or that told me about them in the first place uh, wins because now they've built more rapport with them because of it. And I win because I'm planting a seed for a completely new relationship and I'm doing it from a place of rapport and social proof. So that's closing the loop in order to foster a new relationship. Let me give you an example of reinforcing an existing relationship using the same tactic. So I was at another event and was talking to someone I had just met. He was one of the biggest, by far, nonfiction authors of 2017 and someone I, who I share many mutual friends with. I started the conversation, as I preached before, fully focused on him, asking a lot of questions and bringing up a lot of uncommon commonalities, including certain friends. We shared a few stories about one friend specifically over dinner. So I followed up with that said friend the following day and said, Hey, you know, I've been with so and so over the last couple of days. And last night over dinner, he told me of how you guys originally connected, how you re he reached out to you when you were just a blog, all that kind of stuff. No need to reply. And I put that in, in bold. Uh, I just thought I would let you know that we both raved about you for a big portion of the night. Enjoy your week. Again, a message like this leaves the person I emailed feeling appreciated. It makes the person that talked about them look good and allows me to make a micro investment in an existing relationship through a check-in. Planting relationship seeds are important, but watering or nurturing those said seeds is critical should you want to develop deep relationships. Check-ins are a strong relationship investment vehicle that a lot of people get dead wrong. LinkedIn has those stupid canned messages you can send where it's like, you know, click here to send a congrats on your work anniversary message. And you end up getting a hundred of these in a day. And it's from people who sent the exact same word for word message that was sent last year. And there was no communication in between, or I'll personally get dozens of emails a month from people who say, Hey man, how are things? Just want to say, hi, what are you working on in the new year? Well, amazing. Now, you know, I'm busy enough as it is. Now I need to fill you in on what I'm up to, even though a, it can all be found on social media through my updates. And B, you really don't care. You're just asking to kind of check a, a box off your to-do list. A friend of mine positioned it to me to kind of treat email or a follow-up for that matter, almost like a phone call. You wouldn't call someone you don't know all that well midday and say, hey there, you know, what are you working on in, in, in the new year? How can I help you? So let that be your filter. Have check-ins that matter. Check-ins that matter. I just gave you an example earlier where in closing the loop, it gave me a great excuse to kind of check in with someone. Most of my check-ins revolve around intel that I collected through conversation. If someone is becoming a first-time dad in three weeks, I'll set a reminder to send them an email in six weeks from now seeing how fatherhood is treating them. Or maybe someone is training for a Spartan race in six months, I'll set a reminder to send an email a week in advance saying, you know, wishing them luck, or maybe they're speaking at an event, or maybe they're launching a book. Check in with ideas of how you can support them or just be their, their biggest fan, or maybe offer some kind of connections. That's how you foster and nurture long lasting relationships. So to recap, anybody I know who really makes the most out of live experiences judges an event, not by the content, but by the potential connections. A common question I get is how do I find these great live events filled with awesome people? Well, unfortunately, I don't have a list to share. It depends on where you are, where you want to go. But one commonality that changed the game for me was focusing on more intimate events that had a sizable price point. Going to expensive events was definitely a leap of faith for me at first, but I realized early on that a higher investment separated the talkers from the real players and people took the experience and the, the the relationships far more seriously in those settings now this isn't a sweeping guarantee that you know if you go to an event that's intimate and costs a lot of money that it will be better but that's definitely been two of the contributing factors to some of the best and most impactful events that i've ever been to and listen at first it's, it's definitely a leap of faith i mean most people don't invest in relationships or events for that matter because they have a hard time associating an roi to them with that said 
leveraging a lot of what I shared in this episode, I could look back at an original attendee list from an event that I attended in 2011, which is over seven years ago at the time of this recording, and confidently say that out of the 127 people in attendance of that event, 48 have become friends of mine. Folks that I could reach out to at any time for their expertise or an introduction and a connection. Eight of those 48 people have become some of my closest friends. People I could call on, I feel, at any time, day or night. People who I have their back and they have mine. It's been said that the melancholy of old age is that you can't make old friends. So start investing in meaningful relationships today. And maybe that's just by using some of these tactics at the next event you attend. So that's it for this episode, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for listening. As mentioned earlier in the show, to help you get the most out of the next event that you attend, we've designed a pre-event checklist. If you're a member of the Community Made Group, you'll find that checklist in the resource section. If you're not a member, no excuse. It's free. Simply go to communitymade.com to get access. And as a quick side note for fun, I made mention earlier as well that I decided to take some of these principles on how to grow, nurture, and amplify your business relationships and teach them in a live, intimate workshop setting. To my surprise, that first workshop sold out in a day and a half. So I decided to schedule a second workshop. So for dates and availability on that said workshop, visit superconnectorworkshop.com. That's superconnectorworkshop.com. Com. If you enjoyed this episode, nothing would make me happier than hearing your thoughts or biggest takeaways. Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at Jason Gaynard, J-A-Y-S-O-N-G-A-I-G-N-A-R-D, or email me at Jason, J-A-Y-S-O-N, at communitymade.com. Before I go, I got to give out a, a nice little shout out to my good friend Josh Stanton from Vancouver, Canada, for leaving the following review on Facebook. He said, Jason will for sure go down as one of the greatest connectors of all time. He's a true champion and an incredible builder of community, something the world needs more of for sure. Thank you very much, my man, for the rating and review. For the rest of you out there, if you enjoyed this episode of the podcast or like what we're doing here at Community Made, I would be forever grateful if you shared this podcast with your friends or leave us an honest review on either iTunes or Facebook, just like Josh did. Join me for the next episode of Community Made, where I sit down with my great friend, Clay Bear. What's funny is why we get introductions wrong we either never get taught how to do it well, um, which which is very common. You know, to get a driver's license, at least in states, you you have to sit next to some smelly guy in parallel park on a hill and remember to use the emergency brake, and then they give you the little piece of plastic that says you can drive, which you know you should have to to do that. But we introduce ourselves every day, and we never had to pass a test. We never had to, and nobody ever taught us. Or the one way that we learn, as I started to research and figure out figure this out, is we learn this stupid thing called the elevator pitch. Thanks again for listening, ladies and gentlemen. I'll see you on the next episode.